Gotham Knights Episode 1 is a show that's got everything. We've got a fight scene that breaks time and space. <laughs> Where's he gone? This is the right hand view of the camera. Where is he? A cop gets kicked out of an interview for offending a criminal's feelings. I got another dead name for him. Bruce Wayne. Ford, take a walk. Oh, and Batman's son does get humiliated throughout the entire show. Five minutes in a cell with you and you didn't have the brains to be the brains behind this frame job. This is gonna be a fun one. After my parents were murdered, I was adopted by the richest man in the city. All right, dude, you don't have to sound so bored about it. He's the richest man in the city. Surely that's a good thing, but also this is entertainment. Put some emotion into your voice, mate. He hid from the world who he really was behind the mask. Wait, why has he got a drawer in his office which only hides his mask and two batarangs? You might be thinking, oh, it's so he can hide his identity in emergency. But what happens when Bruce Wayne in Bruce Wayne's clothes come running out of Bruce Wayne's office wearing a Batman mask? I just think people might be able to put two and two together, that's all. Also, in this show, we have the most remarkably, terribly hidden Batman tools. Because in this, he just touches the top of the shelf, and I guarantee you, someone will touch that when cleaning. But the worst one comes later with the Batcave, and I'm not going to spoil that for you, because it has to be seen to be believed. He hid from the world who he really was. But then again, so did I, pretending to fit into a world I didn't belong. Did you just compare being Batman to going to a posh school? One guy risks his life fighting crime, whereas you just struggle to eat because of the silver spoon in your mouth. You are not the same. But we get introduced to one of the main characters, can't remember her name, don't really care, and apparently she's a computer hacker. At least all of the reviews called her a computer hacker, because in this episode, she doesn't actually hack anything. The back computer does all of the work, and uh, you should see the back computer. <laughs> but the son is incredibly annoyed Batman didn't turn up to watch him poke people with a metal stick, and so says, eh, let's just have a party at my house. That's how we end up with a party at Wayne Manor. You know when you said you couldn't understand why the richest man in the city would adopt you? Well, after seeing this, nor can I. In fact, I'd be asking my lawyers for some kind of annulment, but it is all okay, because despite the falling vase, it gets saved by Mystery Woman. Nice reflexes. Thanks. Carrie, we have trick together? Now, apparently this is really rude and bad form to me. It's just my life. I don't remember names of anything. If you think I give people nicknames in a TV show for entertainment value, I don't. That's just how my mind works. I remember by description, except Batman's son thinks this about it. Sorry, I suck. I mean, you might do, but I don't know how that's related to not knowing somebody's name. Tell that to all the people here to celebrate you going to state. I don't know half their names either. Based. But next up, he gets caught by Cressida, who turns up at the party, and we never know who she is. Just this random woman turns up called Cressida, and I have no idea who she is, what relation she has to the family, what position she has with anybody. She's just called Cressida. Cressida, I'll make sure this is all cleaned up. That's all the information you're gonna get. I see you're destroying this house. Don't worry, Cressida, I'll clear it up. Yeah, but who is she? Oh, I haven't seen a thing. Certainly haven't seen the amorous couple making use of the billiards room. Yeah, but why should we care what you've seen in the first place? I don't know who you are. Ironically, she's the one name I do know in the show, and that's all I know about her. Now, for some reason, he's incredibly offended that two people are making out in the billiards room. Not because he minds them doing in his house, it's specifically this room for some reason that he never actually really explains. There are 30 other rooms in this place to hook up, and that's a 17th century couch. I have a feeling most things in this house are old and expensive, though. It kind of goes with being rich. Technically, it's a canopy. That's definitely a sofa. That's definitely a couch. I just googled it. A canopy is a single long seat instead of separate cushions, but I could specifically see the separation between the cushions on your pissing seat. This is something the show does all of the time. One of the characters will come out with a smart rebuttal to something, which is absolutely stupid, doesn't make sense, but is intended to humiliate the person they're talking to. Except I'm just sitting here thinking there's no way you thought that was smart. Stephanie? Okay, so he's just said her name is Stephanie. I'll forget that in the next 30 seconds, but maybe you'll remember it. But we cut to Wayne Tower. The security guard sees the cleaning staff, and this guy thinks he can block the CCTV by painting it with a mop. There is a problem in that I can clearly see his face in the CCTV. And it doesn't really matter if you get rid of CCTV cameras, which have already recorded your face and doing this to them will simply mean the security guards in the camera office will now know that you're there and come and find you. Hello, dude, that someone's just blocked one of the cameras with soap. Uh, I think there's a burglary going on. Okay, they're blind, we're clear. Well, you're not clear, mate. You got caught on candid camera. But at that point, we find out one of them is hiding in the cleaning cabinet he's been pushing around. So she gets out of that. And then we get a third person out of an air vent. How did she get in there? Because apparently she was in there to disable the motion sensors. But if you could just get in through the vents, why are you pushing one of them along in a cleaning cabinet? I just don't understand. But this is the Joker's daughter, and these two are just, as far as I can tell, two random people she found somewhere. She did recruit them specifically for this job and their talents, although I'm not really sure what he's doing, because at least she can pick locks and break into safes. I can understand if she comes as a package deal with her brother, 
but he shouldn't get a third. The only thing he's done is got himself caught on camera. It just goes to show this show likes to humiliate all men, even the ones that just identify as the must be some of that inherited privilege. But she breaks into the vault and realizes somebody else has already done it. But inside is the gun they came for. She's not just any old gun. She's the one Joe Chill used to pop Bruce Wayne's mom and dad. Look, I know he's Batman, but it is a little creepy to keep the gun that killed your parents. But there's a problem because they find out the barrel's warm. They throw away all common sense by basically looking down the barrel and going, it's been fired recently. Careful, love. If it fires again, you'll lose most of your face. It's been fired recently. I'd love to know how she thought the barrel of a gun got warm without it being fired. So she had to sniff it to make sure. I don't know, maybe he just held it under a Bunsen burner for a while. It could have been anything. But they panic as they realize it's a trap. A police helicopter turns up with a message on the window, your bat is dead. And they realize Bruce Wayne has been thrown through it. We've been set up. I'm glad you told us, love, because the audience definitely couldn't have put two and two together on this one. But as they try to flee, the police turn up on the scene. And Harvey Dent, who's 100% definitely not Two-Face, find the body with Batman's mask on and it's shattered on one side just enough so they know it's Bruce Wayne. What a coincidence, because if this bit of his cowl hadn't been shattered, absolutely no one would have had any idea who he was. And I would show you that, but he's covered in tomato ketchup and the powers that be wouldn't like it. See, he knows who I'm talking about. Back upstairs, as they're trying to flee, security guards arrive on their floor. And what happens next makes absolutely no sense. I've watched it multiple times at 0.25 speed, and I can't work it out how it happens. But I'm going to do my best because it's over very quickly so that they can hide how terrible this is. These two guys come out the elevator. Joker's daughter charges at them, and there's a guy on the left who points his gun, and the guy on the right. Duella takes on the guy on the left. She knocks the gun out of his hand, and I want you to watch the guy on the right, because I have no idea why this happened. <laughs> He just puts his gun down. The only reason I can see for it is that she gets her bag and we see her here. I think she's meant to throw it in the background because she swings it up in the air. So as he's getting disarmed, a handbag is getting thrown at this guy and that's what makes him surrender. And just puts his gun on the floor because a handbag was thrown at him gently. But it gets worse because remember where this guy is and what's happened to him. Where's he gone? This is the right-hand view of the camera. Where is he? You had a handbag thrown at you, mate. It's not that serious. Except apparently it is. Because Duella continues to fight the same guard, both the other two people are still behind her. They do nothing else to the other security guard except throw that one bag once. Duella takes down her security guard, which she's been fighting for the entire time, but then turns around and kicks the other guy in the face, who is somehow teleported behind her where she's already walked through at some point. So this guy got hit with a handbag, walked backwards, let her walk past him, then staggered forwards and decided to get down on the floor ready to get kicked in the face. At no point did either of the other two people fight him during this entire scene. And as far as I can tell, the only way he got backwards and forwards is by teleporting. I hate everything about that fight. It's the first fight of the episode, and what it does is signal the downfall of the rest of the episode because this moment is where we hit the edge of the cliff and jump off. Because this guy uses two walkie-talkies to send the police to the wrong staircase and they escape out the back and decide that their best plan is to get into a police car and hotwire it when they're surrounded by police. Personally, I would have just casually walked down the street like a normal civilian, but apparently we're going to draw attention to ourselves. Either way, somehow they get away with it and escape in the police car. Meanwhile, we go back to the party. Could have hooked up with anyone and you picked Brody. At least I didn't hook up with Olive Silverlock and my dad's Maserati. Hey, I mean, the night's still young and this is the CW. Stick around long enough, they'll get you to do that as well. Here's to questionable choices. Signing up to do a CW show definitely classifies as questionable choices. I'll drink to that. Didn't say I was questioning mine. I didn't say I was questioning mine. I'm more than happy to be a rampant whore. Don't worry, love. Give it 30 years, you'll be able to get another role in Milf Manor. But she says, you know, he's jealous of you right? Because you've got everything he wants. And he gives her that look. Eight minutes into the episode, we get that look. They're already setting up a love triangle eight minutes into the episode. It's not enough to just humiliate him throughout the entire episode. We've got to get him to fawn over somebody who's banging other people as well. Dude, you're the son of Bruce Wayne. You can do better. The issue is, police arrive, and they deliver the news that his father, Bruce Wayne, has died. Turner, it's your father. I'm so sorry, I don't even know how to tell you this. You had a long car journey over here. You could have at least bothered to think of something. What were you doing during the ride, playing Mamma Mia and got distracted or something? He's dead. If you're gonna be that blunt, I don't know why it took you so long to think of something to say. But Harvey has some words of reassurance for Batman's son, whose name I really should probably learn. Turner, apparently, I'm never gonna remember that. I need a nickname stat. But the message he gives him is pretty interesting. I am gonna find who did this and I'm gonna make them pay. I mean, I should hope so. That's your pissing job, mate. You're a policeman. It's literally what you get paid to do. Now I'm just concerned about what you do normally. Don't worry, son. This time I'll make a special effort and actually catch them. That's what everybody said back then. That's because they were police as well. 
which also makes it their pissing job as well. Turner gets upset, people tell him they're gonna do their job, more news at 11, but it ends with Castiel asking him if he knew Bruce Wayne was Batman. Take that as a no then. But of course, this is Turner with dangly bits, and that means the show needs to humiliate him at every chance it has. And so is logic on why Batman can't be Batman, it's it's not the best. He can't be Batman. If he was, where is it? Where's the bat suit? Is that how you judge everything? If you haven't seen the bat suit, he can't be Batman. There's no way he could have hidden that in a different location. He would have told me. Sometimes parents keep secrets. Yeah, that they're banging the nanny. Not that they go out and fight crime as a superhero. I just think you should be a little more shocked here, love. That's all I'm saying. I know my dad. Well, you didn't know him that well. He was Batman. And he sure as hell was not sneaking out at night fighting bad guys. Well, at this point, you're just wasting good whiskey. The thing is, it turns out that that's a plot point, because throwing that whiskey bottle reveals the most important thing about Batman, in the most stupid way possible. Because this is a CW show and we can't have nice things. Because this, and this is the best view of it that you actually get, is where the Batcave is. Where he's just thrown the bottle. And he gets alerted to it by... Do you hear that? Dripping whiskey. You see, for some reason, when they were hiding the Batcave, one of the most secret things that Bruce Wayne actually owns, nobody, not a single person on the entire team thought, Maybe we should put the door all the way to the floor so nobody can see underneath it. Literally anyone that walked into this room could walk in, see a massive gap underneath the stone plinth, and think, hang on, where's that light coming from? That's meant to be a solid wall. And don't worry, it gets worse. Because this is a CW, it always gets worse. Because he notices the whiskey dripping into a massive hole that shouldn't be there, and walks over and feels the stones, and the massive gaps on either side of the middle stone. And you can see just how big and obvious that center stone actually is in this shot. And that's important because of this. <laughs> that's the entrance to the pissing bat cave. You just walk into this room, rest your weight on a massive stone slab, at hand height, and suddenly you open a door to the bat cave. I don't know, it just doesn't seem very well hidden to me. That is the worst way to hide a bat cave I could have thought of. You could have had a panel with a keypad on the side and it still would have been more discreet than that. But they're absolutely stunned at what they've discovered, presumably, because it's so stupid. If they walk in, why do you have automatic LEDs under your steps in a perfectly well lit room? No, seriously, why the LEDs, mate? Can you imagine the talk to the engineers? Oh, by the way, I know there's loads of lights up on the ceiling, but could you install some Philips Hues under my steps? <laughs> yeah, there's no real reason because the overhead lights, but it might look cool if somebody decides to film me entering it one day. We also decide to light up the entire exit road, even though we've just entered the Batcave. He could have at least waited until he got in his car, but apparently no, we just like having our exit road lit the entire time even if we're just doing some computer work in Excel. And there is the back computer to come yet. It's true. Wait, you didn't realize it when you found a secret underground cave under your father's mansion who was accused of being Batman? You only actually believed him when a road lit up. Okay. But we get Bruce Wayne's funeral. Everyone lines up by the side. They're in mourning because Batman, their protector, is gone. Who will protect Gotham now that Batman is dead? The police. I mean, it's what they get paid to do. Let them deal with it. Besides, everywhere else in the entire world had to cope without a Batman. I'm sure you'll find a way. But just before the funeral, they get an anonymous tip that they know the location of the gang which has supposedly killed Batman. So he goes off to raid that while Harvey stays at the funeral. Guys, th this is blood money. I mean, firstly, you're a criminal. I'm not sure why you're trying to take the moral high ground. And secondly, no it isn't because you haven't actually killed anybody. But they keep complaining at Joker's daughter who is easily the best character out of this trio. Moaning that she didn't get the name of the person who hired her for a job. She's like, of course I didn't. We're criminals. Do you think people just go around giving everyone their name, you lunatics? Although it is weird that during the scene, Joella keeps counting the money she's been given, despite the fact that they've had this before they did the job, so it's not as if she doesn't know how much is there. I'm just recounting it for fun. Funeral starting. Wanna get out of here now? Now's our chance. Why would a funeral happening allow you to get out of the city? I can only assume he thinks the entire GCPD will be at the funeral or something. They're not. Because we go over to the funeral, there's about five of them there. Because you need the rest of the policemen to be policing the city. So the funeral doesn't help you escape at all. But obviously, everyone at Batman's funeral is incredibly upset. Except apparently Batman's son. Because as we know with Turner, we like to deliver every single line exactly the same way. Even at a funeral. For years, you knew Bruce Wayne as Gotham's most prominent businessman, Batman. But to me, he was just my dad. It's very emotional. I'm almost in tears. And during the funeral, the police raid the gang. For some reason, despite the fact that they get raided by armed police through every door with flashbangs, they still decide to fight. You've literally got SWAT going in, and she's like, yeah, but I can fist fight you. She has got to be at least a foot smaller than that guy, but apparently, no. 
fighting him's no problem for her. But instead of retreating into despair, he became a force for justice, a beacon of hope. The music really wants you to think this is an incredible, emotional, inspirational moment, a sad moment, but one with hope for the future. It's just every line delivered by Turner really undermines that message. Because my father believed that each of us could become a light strong enough to defy the darkness. That's actually the peak of his speech. That's the end of his speech. I actually thought it built up to something important, where he could give a really courageous end to it all, and... No, that was it. You probably should have just said he's the hero we need but don't deserve. It would have been way better. When in doubt, steal somebody else's lines. It'll probably get you through a lot further. Now, of course, randomly and suspiciously, we've got somebody's name who I can't remember from Trig here to put a rose on his grave. Nobody thinks it's odd that a 19-year-old was putting a single rose on Batman's grave. Then again, I guess he was a billionaire. Thought you might find a little solace knowing that we got him. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. I don't know if this is meant to be a reference, but it is the CW. So probably. But he's still not happy because he wants to know who put them up to it. We're gonna find whoever it was. I should hope so. That's your pissing job. Can we stop having the police going, don't worry, I'm definitely gonna do some policing on this one. I don't normally, but I will on this one, I'll make sure. With no Batman, who's gonna solve the murder of Bruce Wayne? The police? If they're not doing any policing, why do they even exist? There's absolutely no way Batman did every single investigation in Gotham. It, it's impossible. Somebody must have worked out something at some point. But then we get reports that the mutant gang rampages across Gotham them because now Batman's out, everyone's coming out to play. We've got Cressida making another appearance, even though we still have no idea who she is, or what relation she even has to the family, or what she does. All we know is she's called Cressida. I will let slide the occasional pillaging of the wine cellar. Truancy is another matter entirely. Yeah, but who are you and what do you do around here? At least call her the nanny or something. Your father had Alfred, you have me. Firstly, what happened to Alfred? Batman got killed, we still don't know where Alfred went. I know all of this may have been explained in the comics, but for the people that don't know the comics, you may want to put that in your series. And there's no way you're his Alfred, you're not his butler. So what do you actually do? I mean, I'll try to be a bit more fun now. But what do you do? I've watched this twice, I still don't know. In and out of juvie? Oh no, now we get to the interviews. The interviews are simultaneously the worst and most hilarious part of the episode. I was pissing myself laughing the first time I saw these, so I warn you, you'll either need a bucket or a nappy, depending on how this goes. It starts reasonably enough. He's talking to her about the crime she's done. Turns out she shattered her lawyer's kneecaps because she said, you know, it looks like you're guilty if you considered pleading guilty. Wasn't too keen on that plan. I would like to speak with my legal counsel. And you shouldn't have shattered her kneecap. I mean, you say that, but there's gotta be plenty more lawyers in the seat. But they're certain she's guilty. They've got a prince on the gun and a pile of money with it. So the evidence on them is strong. The whole thing starts to go downhill though when Harvey starts joining the interviews. Police found this on you. So, is it true? Are you really the Joker's daughter? I'm pretty sure the trailers had something different for that, where he's actually calling her, uh, wild card. There's a couple of scenes in this episode where they took different takes than the trailers. But we start to fall on the cliff when Joker's daughter thinks she's being smart. You're saying I did it for the money. You're saying I did it out of revenge. Yes. And those two things aren't mutually exclusive. Somebody paid me to do something that you say I would have happily done for free? Yes, perfectly reasonable thing to think. You see it all the time on Twitch streams. I was going to play this new game anyway, but they came to me and offered me a sponsorship to play their new game that was going to play anyway? This is gold! She's not smart enough to realize that though. I'm not a big fancy lawyer. I'm just a girl with two working kneecaps. Okay, you may have just explained why you don't even understand basic logic. You two might want to get your story straight before you take this to a judge. Yeah, get your story straight before you take your perfectly reasonable explanation to a judge. Could you just see the smugness on her face as she thinks she's got one over on him? I'm so smart! Despite the fact that I can't understand what you said. Meanwhile, back at Batman school, the blonde's fancy man comes up to him, I hope you're okay, it must be difficult keeping a secret all this time, but at least now the story's out, you must be feeling a lot of relief. Yeah, that's what I'm feeling. Relief. I mean, at least we know, even when he's supposed to be incredibly angry, he still delivers his lines exactly the same way as every single other time. Hello, my name's Turner, I can deliver a line however you want as long as it's monotone and deadpan. But the blonde doesn't like it, so he gets offended and leaves. Meanwhile, the only thing I can think is what on earth is going on with this guy's hair? And when I say that, you know you're in trouble. It looks like all of his hair got pulled back and they're just cut in a straight line. I have no idea what's going on or why anyone would want a vertical straight line of hair at the back. It's weird. Either way, Turner leaves and she follows him through a door which has an old keypad on it, up some stairs with danger and into what I'm assuming is like an old bell tower of the school. They have a talk about how the villains knew Batman better than he did because he didn't know his secret. And how the GCPD are looking into it, but they're probably not going to find it and they might be able to help. Give it time. The GCPD is throwing everything they have at this. There's one thing they don't have. Batman? Sorry, was that too soon? A 
Batcave. Oh, well, that doesn't have Batman either. But I don't know why you think the Batcave will help. You don't know what it does. As far as you know, it's a cave with a car in it and some Phillips shoes under the stairs. But no, for some reason, these school children think that they can track down the killers by walking into a cave. So back they go, and we get introduced to the Bat computer. And this computer proves one thing. They have no idea what a computer is or how it works. They just wanted to make it look complicated. And how do you make something look really powerful and complicated? Well, one thing you could do on a severe budget is add more keyboards to everything. You could have a basic three monitor setup. Haven't even gone for an ultra wide to make it look impressive. No, we'll just three normal monitors. Have a keyboard per monitor. Then add another 60% keyboard on top of those just to make it look extra fancy with the buttons. And why not add an extra keyboard underneath for luck? Oh, and this is the bad computer. You can't just have any normal mouse. That'd be weird. No, you've got to be extra fancy. So over here, we've got a vertical mouse. Wouldn't want Batman to get carpal tunnel when he's using his mouse, would you? And that, as far as I can tell, is the Logitech vertical mouse. I'm sorry, but if you think a complex computer is adding more keyboards than a vertical mouse, Maybe you shouldn't have been the one to design the computer on the set. Why does every monitor need a separate keyboard in the first place? Just get one keyboard that swaps between multiple computers. Or better yet, if you want to be really advanced, just combine all of your servers into one computer so you only need one keyboard. I think these people saw the meme of two idiots, one keyboard and thought we're not falling for that. Let's get nine for one person. I think you can use it to hack into Gotham National Bank. I mean, it's a computer. She can do anything on that computer. She could do on another computer. It's also worth noting she's using the far left monitor and one keyboard, which she continues to do for the rest of the episode. We've got three monitors and nine keyboards, but we only use one of each, like a normal person. What were the others for? Back at the police interviews, and these are the really bad ones. Before graduation, you drop out. Maybe you can do that math for me. It's not math. It's history. I'm sorry, are we supposed to think that that's an intelligent rebuttal? Because she does. Firstly, if you want to be really picky about it, maths has an S on the end of it. You just say things to wind up Americans. Maybe. Uh. <laughs> but secondly, it's a turn of phrase. If you don't understand a saying, so take it literally and try to correct him, you're not the one who looks intelligent in this scenario. And I've got to be honest, the dirt face really just, you, we need a mirror at this point. But she tells the story about how mom left and because the dad didn't have her to attack, he turned on the kids. Because this is a CW show, so all men must be humiliated, crap at everything and evil. Throughout this entire episode, as far as I can remember, every single person's dad is either dead or a wife beater. Pure coincidence, I'm sure. It's definitely not the writer's daddy issues which they project onto their characters. He didn't have a problem with bisexual chicks in his point. Having one under his roof was another story. Oh yeah, did I forget to tell you? This is where the show goes intersectional. There's no way any daughter of mine's gonna be tipping the velvet. Like seriously, when was this filmed? The 1930s? It's even more stupid to like, well he likes watching them, but you know, at home, that's a different story. Who? Where? It's even weird when you're like, well actually he likes them, but not for me, I'm an exception. I'm definitely not living in the same reality as the writers. I had to get me and my brother but yes, all of that is just using an excuse for her to be a rampant criminal. You know, she may break into places and steal things and rob police cars, but it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. She struggled as a child, and so that means she's not actually responsible for her own actions anymore. Yeah, forget she's an evil criminal. You're supposed to like her now because somebody was mean to her once. And then the show decides to escalate everything. I had to get me and my brother out of there. Your brother. Cullen Rowe. Yep. Castiel is not a fan of that one. Do you have a problem with her saying brother? Really? Because your birth certificate hey, says you were- Don't brother. use his dead name. Yeah, don't do that, dude. We wouldn't want to offend the murderer. And yes, we know he's innocent, but they don't, so that's why they've arrested him. As far as they're concerned, he's a murderer. Are we really going to make a TV show where we make a big deal out of offending a murderer? And the answer is yes. Yes, we are. I got another dead name for him. Bruce Wayne. Ford, take a walk. Why? Because the guy even backs off. When Castiel has a go at him, he's like, okay, okay, I won't do that. You did kill Bruce Wayne though, didn't you? And Castiel's like, you can't accuse him of murdering Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne is dead. And that's his name. What's the problem? <laughs> I think reminding the murderer of the person they killed is probably a good thing to do in interrogation, especially if they've got any kind of emotion at all, they might actually feel guilty. They might confess for it, but apparently we can't do that anymore because you've offended the criminal's fee-fees by bringing up their birth certificate. So he leaves. Sorry about that. Castiel apologizes for the policeman who offended the murderer. From what your sister told me, it sounds like you got enough of that from your dad. And of course, now he's trying to make friends with him. That's also not what his sister said at all. Sister never said the word trans at all during the entire interview. No, she was more concerned about herself swinging both ways. As far as we know, problem had no father with the son. Look, I, I know what you're doing. Building trust through performative allyship. Performative allyship. We are hitting all the keywords on this one, aren't we? No one's an ally. We're not going to war. We're not signing diplomatic agreements between nations over here. Yeah, or maybe I'm just not a dick. <laughs> 
forgot he said that. They just keep doubling down on this one. But he says, I know you're not a killer. It was all Duella, wasn't it? It was the Joker's daughter. She did it. Will you testify to her? I can make a jury believe that. That's not what happened. You're just trying to turn us against each other. That's also a very different delivery than they did in the trailers. You're just trying to get us to turn on each other. You're just trying to turn us against each other. In the trailers, we had this confident, arrogant, you're just trying to turn us against each other delivery. In this, it's a lot more shocked, surprised, out of his depth. It's trying to make you feel sorry for him, more sympathetic. I just find it interesting that in the trailers, it's all about being a hardened criminal. I'm not scared of no police. You're just trying to get us to turn on each other. But when you go into the episodes and surround it with all this other stuff, suddenly we've got to turn it round to I'm the victim, feel sorry for me. You're just trying to turn us against each other. But then in an attempt to save a brother, the sister says, it was me, I did it all, it's all my fault. I'll sign whatever confession you want, but my brother walks. Who paid you the money? I don't know. Then we don't have a deal. That's probably the first good thing Castiel's done in the entire interview. And the rest of it, I want to be your friend. No, you should rot in prison. Back in the Batcave now, and they're trying to find out who paid them. They know they got paid a hundred grand, so she decides to run a search for anyone that's withdrawn a hundred grand from their account. And then she's amazed because she didn't hack into anything, but she has access to literally everything. Every business, every stock or bank account, she can see it all. Let me see if I can run a search for cash withdrawals. Oh, yes I can. Bearing in mind she's supposed to be a computer hacker, and yet was surprised that she can run a search. She's also only using one keyboard. At that point, Turner sees the Batarang and he's like, just give me the information, I'll sort it out. But she won't let him, she wants to hand it over to the police. I'm not helping you become some vigilante. Spoiler alert, she's gonna help him become a vigilante. What an epic plot twist that's gonna be. Here's to questionable choices. But luckily, they find one matching document because only one person in the entire city has withdrawn $100,000 recently. That was lucky. So she says 17 withdraws the exact amount that he were paid of $5,882.35, which times 17 is 5 cents off. They were paid 100 grand, it's the exact amount they were given. All in notes, by the way. And yet apparently he withdrew 35 cents at a time. But no, 17 withdrawals of this, it's the exact amount when it's five cents off. I can't help but feel I'm getting trolled. And they just wanted people to do that maths equation and find out that it was deliberately wrong. But they look for the name on the account. Whose account is it? Yours. That's probably not the best sign. This makes it look like the person who paid to have your dad killed is you. Because he's getting set up as well. The thing is, all of these 17 withdrawals were done in cash. And he withdrew numbers which ended in 35 cents, which you can't do at a cash point. You have to do at a bank itself. You know what a bank will have? Cameras. Could we just go and look at the cameras? This supposed setup for murder literally doesn't work the moment you even go and ask one question at a bank. It is the most ridiculous setup job I've ever seen. But the police turn up and arrest him anyway, because apparently they've received a tip off. And there's Cressida again, even though I have no idea what she does. Harvey comes in and tells him not to speak to the police without his lawyer present, which you would have thought the police would have told him in the first place. Serial numbers on the bills from his account match the ones the suspects were found. Yes, but what about the CCTV cameras at the bank of him withdrawing the money? Or in this case, not withdrawing the money. Are you telling me this person went into a bank 17 times and didn't get caught on CCTV? And if you like, well, he hid his face so he's not on CCTV so he can't be caught. No, he didn't. He was withdrawing from an account with his own name on it. It's not like he was trying to hide. I don't even know how they think he thought he would have got away with it. Three days before he was murdered, Bruce Wayne made an appointment to alter his last will and testament. Sounds like a hell of a motive to me. Yeah, they think Bruce Wayne was going to cut him out of his will, and so he killed him so he couldn't change his will. I mean, you would have thought if you were getting cut out of the will, he would have kicked you out of the house first. But who knows, maybe Bruce Wayne was going to donate it all to a cat sanctuary or something. But Castiel tells Turner, I've talked to Cressida, and your law firm isn't going to represent you because everybody believes that you did it, except me. But then Castiel decides to take all of his police training, throw that out the window, and break every single rule in the book when he says this. Night he was killed, this was found on your father. I'm just gonna hand you evidence in a murder investigation. That should have been tagged and bagged and then the police evidence locker, and you've just decided to take it out and hand it to the main suspects in the investigation. I really hope you've checked that for fingerprints because his are gonna be all on them now, which means that if anything happens to those fingerprints, you can't go back and rescan them because you've contaminated the crime scene. You could have even given it to him in a bag, but no, we're just gonna destroy everything, who cares? Apparently it's a 6th century Athenian coin. That makes all the difference then. If it's a 6th century Athenian coin, why didn't you tell me before? I wouldn't have kicked up a stink about it. Does it mean anything to you? Anything at all. No. Well, you're a lot of use, aren't you? That was worth destroying a crime scene for. But with that, they take him away and put him in a cell. Apparently, the only cell in the entire police station because they put him in the same cell as the people he's accused of setting up for murder. Whether they were hoping that he'd get killed at this point, I don't know, but I don't think so considering what happens later. But first, we've got to be treated to some more acting. Oh, look, it's the Bat Brand. 
I think this is him trying to do his intimidating hard face, but instead, uh, he's pouting. Don't pout when you're trying to be intimidating. It doesn't work. I don't know whether you're trying to scare me or come on to me. It's weird. But we get an exposition dump about her history, about how, yes, I may be the Joker's daughter, but actually he was mean to me. He left me in Arkham because he left my mom for a younger model. When he started banging little Size 2 get out of jail free card named Harley Quinn. I mean, it does seem like he made the right decision. Size 2 and get you out of Arkham, that's win win. So I would sooner send your dad a thank you note than send him flying out a window. I hate my dad. That's right, folks. It's another character with daddy issues. Like I said, every single dad did this is evil or dead. Or both. I feel like a therapist with the writers at this point. So. Tell me about the relationship you had with your father. What, you don't talk to the hired help? I did not pay you to kill my dad. At least we get to see that even under pressure, his acting is of exactly the same quality as every time he delivers any line. If we needed a metaphor for his acting, it would be the dialing tone of a landline. I just realized a lot of people won't even get that. They've probably never even had a landline. <laughs> I am really old. <laughs> Maybe you should act like the sound of a 56k modem, that'd be interesting. You don't know how lucky you are to actually have a dad who cared about you, and you had him killed to what, speed up that little inheritance of yours? Yeah, that's right, now he's in a cell getting whined at by the criminals. You don't know anything about Get So everything starts to heat up, or at least that's what you meant to think, because you can't tell that from the way he's delivering his lines. What, you're gonna say I pulled the trigger? You didn't have to, your prints are all over the damn gun! And that is the best we're gonna get for any kind of variation on that acting. Of course, Joker's daughter doesn't respond very well to that, and so headbutts him in the face, which of course he just lets happen before he gets rammed into a wall and repeatedly battered. Because you know, this is Bruce Wayne's son and he's got dangly bits, and so he can't be allowed to actually do anything useful. That's why he just keeps getting repeatedly punched as he turtles himself like a little coward into a tiny little ball. Your new male superheroes, everybody. And I should say that my common use of dangly bits to describe people throughout all of these reviews is rather interesting when it comes to this show. It will be interesting across other episodes to see if anyone with dangly bits actually does anything useful, because they certainly don't in this scene. In fact, even when the other two people are holding her back, she's still beating the crap out of him because he's that useless. <laughs> to the point where he gets smashed into the wall with force, even when she's being restrained. If this guy does anything to anyone without significant training, it's gonna be a miracle. But the police do come in to break the fight up, who just starts smacking everyone with batons. If you thought he was going to be able to do anything just because these are the police now, well, you're, um, you're very much mistaken as he takes a baton to the face. The issue is he's too slow to actually react. He's already been hit by the baton at this point and hasn't started moving. The guy literally completes his entire swing and then he reacts to the hit. CW quality, everybody. It's, it's, it's an amazing sight to behold, it really is. Either way, eventually the police get the upper hand and they get sent to the van for transport. But first, Turner gets his phone call. During this time, Harvey's being confronted by the press. You're a friend of the Wayne family. Will you be recusing yourself from this case? And that is a good point because I don't think he has any choice. City's already convicted the kid. You just need to make it official. I'm practically his uncle. Well, you definitely can't investigate your own family, so you have no other choice. Not sure that's the campaign slogan I would have picked for you. Yes, it turns out that Castiel wants to be mayor. And one of the best ways you can become mayor is if you announce straight off the back of a huge victory, like putting away Batman's murderer behind bars. And so she pitches him two options. Either you convict these people and become mayor, or your career burns if you try and get him off. Back at the school now, and Turner's decided that he's going to use his one phone call with a random girl he fancies at school. You're about to go to prison for murder. Now may be the time to think with your other head. Shouldn't you be using your one phone call to talk to a lawyer or somebody? That is an excellent point. Very well made. I'm glad the show is pointing out how stupid their own script is. Right now, I just want to talk to someone who believes me. That's right. He doesn't have a plan. He didn't phone her for some top secret mission that he could get her to go on. No, he made a terrible decision all because of his fifis. When everyone acted like I hit the adoption lottery, you saw that Bruce Wayne's become my dad. I had to lose two parents first. Yes, but everyone that's up for adoption has to lose two parents first. That's why they're up for adoption. You're literally trying to claim oppression points and victimhood status, despite the fact that you got picked by a billionaire while everyone else didn't. Oh, I can't believe you thought I won the adoption lottery. You did. You essentially got billions when that happened, I would consider that winning the lottery. And I can't believe you're trying to play who's the biggest victim out of a bunch of orphans. You got me through that. Oh, you got me through being adopted by a billionaire. I'm sure it was a huge struggle for you as you dried your tears on money. But he ends the call by asking her to go back into the Batcave and using the Bat computer with nine different keyboards to find out 
who actually withdrew the money, who set him up. And then he gets escorted to the van for transport with the other criminals. I just want to say, great job back there. Yes, this is his introduction to the characters for real, as now they're on his side. And we get an introduction to Joker's daughter, and oh, oh, she's so much like the Joker, yes, because, you know, she smiles a lot. He made it look so convincing. That was supposed to be fake. Yes, the fight in the cell was faked. Also, they could steal items off the prison guards so that they could pick the locks on their handcuffs. How else could we get our hands on a few of their little trinkets? We stole trinkets off the guards so we can pick the locks. One of us is going to use a pin that we stole, and the other... GCPD letters. Please tell me how you're going to pick a lock with that. What are you going to do? Ram the D in the hole? Okay, that came out wrong. We don't hate each other, but we hate daddy even more. What are you talking about? You haven't figured it out yet? We didn't kill your dad any more than you did. They're coming clean to him because apparently he's too stupid to realize it. And boy, is everyone else fed up of being around the really stupid person with dangly bits, especially Joker's daughter. What are you talking about? What, you haven't figured it out yet? Literally rolls her eyes, looks into the air, oh, give me strength and sighs. I tell you, I don't know whether it's because of the extra bit. He just doesn't have enough blood for his brain anymore or something. But these people are really stupid, aren't they? Five minutes in a cell with you and when you didn't have the brains to be the brains behind this frame job. We were only with you for five minutes and we realized you were a complete moron. There's absolutely no way you could have withdrawn a hundred grand from your bank account and then given it to us. That requires so much brain power. And that's one thing you definitely don't have. You couldn't have withdrawn money from your bank account, you're too stupid for that. Whereas my reasoning would have been, this guy's really stupid. That's probably why he got caught so easily and is in front of me. But whoever is behind it is gonna make sure we have a little accident. Yeah, they just assume that for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Because the only way the setup works is if we all end up dead. And that makes absolutely no sense. You do realize a setup is a setup, and just because you die in prison, doesn't make it any more or less likely. The evidence will either point to you or it won't. I'm not sure what killing you even achieves. So the guards come back and enter the van. They set off with a police car in front and three patrol cars following them. Time to pick a side. I mean, I'd say not yours because you're so annoying, but everybody in this show is, so it's not like he's got any other options. So maybe that's why, as they're driving through the city, they make their escape. She starts very obviously trying to pick her handcuffs. And despite this, the guard doesn't notice anything because he's on his phone. Don't you understand? He's got dangly bits. That means he's useless at every Everything. So she has to attract his attention what? by literally saying out loud what she's doing. What? Why won't this work? Because otherwise, there's absolutely no way the man will realize what she's doing. She's got to really make it obvious. What the hell are you doing? How, how can you not realize what she's doing when you can see what she's doing? Because she wants you to see what she's doing. We are leading the cow to water, kicking him in it, and he's still refusing to drink. Well, I'm trying to get these stupid handcuffs undone with this damn pin, and it's not working. That is an option as well. Just tell him what you're doing. So even the thickest of dangly bits can work it out. So he gets up to try and stop her. Cool and heart, Brad, no problem getting theirs off. What? Everybody eventually realizes the plan, and somehow these three tiny people managed to take down two armed police, including macing one in the face. Now, for some reason, despite the fact that they had multiple guns, this guy pulls out a taser and is right next to the Joker who's escaping, and yet is just pointing it off in another direction past her face. So she grabs it, points it at the driver, and the driver gets tased. At that point, the Bat Brat decides he's gonna help, undoes his own handcuffs, and starts to grab for the wheel. Now, you'd think when he's holding the wheel, he'd try and do something really safe. Instead, what we get is this. You can't park there, mate. Now, the issue is the cop cars just drive up behind them, get out with guns, and you're like, there's no way you get out of this until they come out with a hostage. Oh my God. And if you all don't back off, I'm going to give him back the bullets. Got to be honest, I do like that line. The thing is, I'm pretty sure I've heard that somewhere else before, but either way, I do like that line. But the police say you're surrounded, you can't get away. If you try, we will fire. And then that moment... No! Dangly Bits decides to get in the way. When I tell you this guy gets humiliated throughout the entire episode, I mean it. Literally, every single decision and action he's ever made has been the wrong one. And this is no exception. What are you doing? What my father would want. Did he want you to be a complete moron? Because I know that's how you turned out. I'm not sure Bruce Wayne would have wanted it, though. We can't prove we're not killers by killing someone. That's not even true. The police walk forwards, and the guy who was the hostage takes this chance. <laughs> to jump from behind him and grab the gun. She's right, you know. What? He's in on it. That's the big twist. The police are in on it as well. By the way, that same police officer who is leading the crooked cops, which are about to just kill everybody here, the completely evil, morally reprehensible cop who's standing in front of them, is the same one who did the dead naming earlier in the episode. Because obviously, 
Only someone who's evil and morally reprehensible would do that. It couldn't have just been a normal police officer. No one normal would do that. Oh, CW, do you have to do everything so surface level? And so obvious. You make your shows like a sledgehammer to the face, you really do. But this turns out their escape is good for the police because now we can shoot them and just say they were trying to escape. I didn't have any other choice. I hope daddy's proud of you because you're about to join him. I mean, from everything we've seen in this episode, no father would be proud of him. This is a guy who can always make the absolute wrong decision in every single scenario. But at that moment, a batarang flies through the air and stabs through his hand, making him drop the gun. Then a rocket launcher comes from a roof and blows up a car. Some more devices land on the cars, shatter the glass, and stun the police officers. And that's when this tiny little girl, who is about a foot and a half shorter than the guy she's trying to beat up, could apparently throw him across the room like he's a rag doll. This is incredible. Her strength is out of this world. She must have super serum or something in her. And I especially like how her back goggles have green lights shining directly into her eyeballs so she can't see anything. Super strong and can fight while blinded. She's incredible. So she takes out the rest of them. I think that's meant to be impressive. I'm still just wondering how on earth do you see with these lights beaming directly into your eyeballs before she takes out the final guy. And we get to see her costume, which was signed off by Batman himself, and it seems to be basically just a black skin suit with a couple of pieces of rubber over the top and some goggles. I mean, Batman was a billionaire, he definitely could have done that. But then again, you could have gone to a charity shop and got better than that, love. Who the hell are you? I'm Robin. I'm still pretty sure that's meant to be impressive. It's such a hyped moment. You go, girl. But then she takes her glasses off, and this is another instance that they've changed it from the trailers. Wait, I know you. Kerry Kelly? From Trey. It's far less of a joke than they put it in the trailer. Kerry Kelly? Wait, I know you. From Trey. In this, it's a realization. In the trailer, it's comedy. Did somebody go through the trailers like I did and think this is absolutely stupid? We need to change the delivery of this because I don't blame them, and you should probably promote them so that at least someone talented is doing something on your show. Tell me, you, you brought the Batmobile, right? No, my mom's car gonna be a tight squeeze. Why does Robin not have a car? Are you telling me Batman let Robin go around the city saving people's lives in her mom's car? The billionaire couldn't even be bothered to buy her own car. I don't know, it just seems like Bruce Wayne was really stingy when he's actually getting all these kids to go out and risk their lives to do things for him. So they all leave. No, I got stuck in. And they're really happy about it, apparently. For some reason, the two of them decide to go to Bruce Wayne's grave. Because, you know, if Bruce Wayne's son escapes from prison, one place you definitely won't check is Bruce Wayne's grave. And he asks her, how do you know to break us out of prison? How do you know that we didn't do it? And she comes up with an absolutely incredible answer. When you work with the world's greatest detective, you pick up a few things. Woman's intuition. Not I looked into it and found out that the payments didn't actually come from you. Not that I found out it wasn't your account, someone else set it up for you. No actual facts or evidence. I didn't go into the back cave and do some research. Nah, I just picked up a few things and felt that way. But they discuss how she knew Bruce Wayne better than he did. She's like, yeah, but he still really loved you. He didn't tell me he was Batman. I saved him and just sort of found out as I dragged him to safety. He turned me into his eyes and ears and gave me these goggles, which completely blind me in any fight. And I absolutely can't see anything because they're because they're terribly designed by the costume department. And she says Batman protected you from his identity because he didn't want you to follow down the same path. So impressed that you never gave into the darkness like he did. Yeah, Batman gave into the darkness. He was a bit crap, actually. Let's just get a few kicks into his ribs before we put him in the ground for good, shall we? Let's build a TV show off the reputation of Batman while we crap on his grave. Congratulations, CW. You are a classy group of people. You really are. But he always used to tell me that his hero was you. Well, that's just pathetic. I've seen how this guy acts. He should be a hero to nobody. Ask him what he'd do in a situation and do the opposite. You'll go far in life. Look, unless we all want to be buried next to him, we might want to get the hell out of here. You never should have been there in the first place. It's a stupid thing to go to. The police were watching that. You would have got caught no matter whether you're there for three seconds or three minutes. So after their escape, Harvey Dent has no other choice but to throw him under the bus. Maybe he would have considered standing by him before, but now he obviously wants to be mayor, and this is a great way of launching his career for mayor. It is interesting the description he gives each of the different characters, though. Harper and Colin Rowe, the Joker's daughter. Yeah, we're not going to say her name. We know her name, but we're not going to say it. We've got Harper and Colin Rowe. Both of those are new characters they made up, and then it's the Joker's daughter. Her name's Duala, but we're not going to say her name. We're going to say her descriptive nickname. 
He's basically me. And Bruce Wayne's own son. Okay, he's definitely me. People who remember by description unite. Turner Hayes. Oh, you had to ruin it by saying his name, didn't you? Now you're just making me look bad. As well as anyone who aids or abets them. He means you, dear. That's why we're on you with the camera, so we all know that this blonde is in danger as well. The question is, does anybody care? Or oh, which keyboard is she gonna use? Oh yeah, she's using the same left-hand monitor with the same bottom keyboard because it's the most ergonomic. No one has used either of the two screens or the other eight keyboards yet. I'll keep you informed. In Willow, we had a running arrow count for the quiver, which she never used. In Gotham, we're gonna see how many keyboards and screens get used on the back computer. I tell you, I give you the true nail-biting reviews, the hard-hitting information. But everyone else decides that they need to go back to Turner's school and sit in the bell tower. They'll be looking for us everywhere. So we stick to the high ground. Nobody really knows about this place. Yes, they do. They obviously do. And as evidence for that, I present to you the picture that we saw five seconds ago. You're in a bell tower, dude. It's pretty obvious it exists. Everybody knows about it. And also, this is a locked door in a school that people walk past every day. This isn't a hidden secret base. But he comes up with a plan. We're going to find out who actually set us up and clear our names. We're a lot of things, but we're not cops. Neither was my dad. Didn't stop him from taking down criminals. Yeah, but your dad was a hyper-intelligent billionaire who trained his body and his mind to be a weapon. Meanwhile, you can't stop yourself getting beaten up by a tiny little girl in a prison cell. You are not the same, and you're so visibly thick, that that was all the proof the criminals needed to know that you didn't set them up. You'll be like going after a criminal organization with a sponge. Hey, over here in the back, I'm pretty sure the guy who killed your dad was that detective who tried to do the same to us. Okay, we've got two sponges because that's a stupid thing to assume as well. You have absolutely no reason to believe that the cop that tried to shoot you also set you up. You got paid a hundred grand to do a job, he probably did as well. I have no reason to think he's the mastermind. But this guy's like he obviously got paid a lot because I stole this watch off him and it is worth a bob or two. The issue is it's probably had some of its value damage because it's got a weird engraving on the back. I don't know why an artistic engraving in the back of the watch would actually lower its value, but for some reason, uh, maybe he's not a very good fence or something. Because that engraving is the owl. I always find if I want to run a top secret crime organization, one thing I do to everyone is hand out very visible watches, which they just display to everybody around them at all times. Nothing says top secret than a symbol which you just wear on your wrist that everyone can see. You're basically advertising that you're a spy for another organization within the police force. And Joker craps herself. We should have just let him kill us. Wait, is that an option? I didn't know that was an option. Could we go back and do that again, do a take two? We could actually be safe from this entire series if we just hit rewind for a bit. Because we're already dead. I mean, I hate to point out the obvious, but you're not, because otherwise everyone would be happy. And she says this watch is a sign of the Court of Owls, the real people that lead this city. But no one's allowed to say anything about it, because if you do, they come for you and they take your head. And he tells her that was on a coin that my dad had, which implies that he was looking into them. No one knows who they are, and you don't dare ask, because if you find out, they'll be the last thing you ever see. I mean, there's worse ways to go, I gotta be honest. Imagine if the last thing you ever saw was this show. And it turns out she learned all this from the time she was in Arkham. There was a poem that actually went around the halls. And it's awful, and I'm not going to go through it all, because it takes forever for her to actually say it. Beware the court of owls that watches all the time, ruling Gotham from a shadowed perch behind granite and lime. Taste of the quality that the court of owls created in poetry. Because nothing is more scary than a poem. But then we cut to the changes to his will, which is what got Batman's son arrested in the first place. Getting burned by Cressida who I still have no idea what she does in this entire show. The show is like, hi, I'm Cressida. You shouldn't go and have a party here. Oh, by the way, I'm evil, everybody. Now that was a character arc worth having in the first episode. I was stunned. And then we cut back to the cop from the interview who brought up the birth certificate and he meets a rather sticky end as he loses his head. Or they'll send the talent for your head. Well, at least the poem was accurate, if nothing else. And oh boy, what was that? Yes, there was a lot of setup, but at least it was events that actually led through to something. No, I don't think it all made sense. I don't think the decisions made sense. And no one seemed to think of basic policing to actually check whether the events they were presented with were true. They just believed everything on the face of it without investigating anymore. At no point did anyone check for CCTV cameras of who was withdrawing the money that had to be done in a bank. No, we'll just assume he's guilty. That interview, oh, that interview, that was simultaneously the most cringeworthy and funny thing that I've seen on TV for a while. Every sentence tops the one before. It was incredible. But I'm not really surprised because this is from the team that did Batwoman. And Batwoman had a lot of the same messaging. But to bundle all of that up into one scene and make it come from one man, the one man who happens to be the evil guy of the episode, the criminal who also gets beheaded at the end of it, is absolutely astonishing. Because only the most evil of person 
would dare bring up a birth certificate. And we even had Castiel right there to say, you can't defend the feelings of a murderer, you should have more respect. And when you combine that with Batman's son making the wrong decision every single time, being humiliated at every turn, put down at every turn, I can only think in an age where Hollywood loves emasculating men. If this is what we get in episode one, can you even imagine what we're going to get in the rest of the series? And quite frankly, I can't wait. But those are just my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know down in the comments below. If you like the video, press like, subscribe. More videos like this in the future, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.